Hello and welcome to the LCTV News. I'm Mukala Kabongo. In this edition of the LCTV News, the Khmer Festival, Spring Forum on Tolerance, Lynn's new personnel director, sit down with Kathleen Walsh and more. Last week during the city council meeting, Drew Russo was unanimously approved by the city council to become the city of Lynn's new personnel director. The approval comes after two rounds of interviews were conducted with strong candidates for the position. Russo's community leadership received praise from Mayor McGee, as well as other members of the mayor's office. For the past four years, Russo has been executive director of Lynn Museum, Lynn Arts. Russo is also a board member at the Lynn Community Health Center. A special permit was granted to Bastica LLC by the Sailing Council for the first marijuana cultivation center. The approved 4,000 square feet growth facility will be on Linden Street. The cultivation site will also enter a host community agreement. City Council have requested that an order control plan be submitted. The City of Lynn's election office announced that they will be visiting six high, all six high schools for a voter registration drive. The drive is to help students who are eligible to vote get registered for the upcoming elections. The drive, which began on May 1st, will go on until May 9th. On May 11th, the Lynn Democrats will be holding a caucus at the Lynn Housing Authority Community Room to elect delegates as well as alternates to the 2019 Massachusetts Democratic State Convention. The Mass Democratic Convention will take place in September at the Mass Mutual Center in Springfield. Demo Democratic Party Chair Gus Bickford believed that the, ca the caucus are a great way to strengthen the party's organization as well as welcome new participants interested in getting involved. Registration for the Lynn Caucus is open to all registered and pre-registered Lynn Democrats. Early Saturday morning, a two-alarm fire tore through a Federal Street home. One man was pulled out of the third floor by the Lynn fire crews. Lynn fire were able to help the man climb down the ladder, and he was taken to Salem Hospital. This is according to Fire Captain Joseph Suzaks. Four residents living in the home have been displaced. Estimated damage to the home is at approximately $100,000. The cause of the fire has yet to be deter determined. Few food, music, and performances was the scene on the Lynn Commons for the annual Kamai Festival. The yearly festival brought together residents from the North Shore and beyond to, cel to celebrate the Cambodian New Year. Traditional performances such as the coconut dance as well as the ceremonial dance were on display during this festival. And you can watch the festival on lintv.org. City Council members addressed the audience during the celebration. State Senator Brendan Crichton, Lynn, Lynn School Superintendent Patrick Tutwiler, and Mayor McGee all spoke on the importance of the contributions the Cambodian community brought to the city. Now for the police update. On Sunday night, an 18-year-old Lynn man was shot in the leg during an attempted robbery on Estes Street. According to Lieutenant Michael Kimmick, the victim, who was yet to be identified, was taken to Salem Hospital with non-life-threatening injuries. Early Sunday, early Sunday morning, another shooting occurred that led to a woman being shot in the hand during a drive-by shooting on Warren Street. No arrests have been made in either incidents, and each remain under investigation. Steve Alamore and Widmark Duval are facing kidnapping and armed robbery charges after taking a man into a home and robbing him of his belongings at Knife Point. The victim, a 24-year-old male, flagged down police after the incident and informed officers that he was approached by four people while waiting for the bus, this according to Lieutenant Michael Kimmick. Almanor and Duval robbed the man of his cell phone, cash, and a watch. Christopher Moke is facing fentanyl trafficking charges after police found the drugs in his home on Sil Silsby Street. Mulcahy was arrested and charged with trafficking over 10 grams of cocaine with intent to distribute cocaine, morphine, sub subsagon, and Class C pills, including clon uh, clon I can't even pronounce that. <laughs> Clonazepin. I always can't pronounce that. We just start with the police. Clonazepin. Yeah, I, I always mess that one up. Clonazepin. Ugh. Words. Ooh. All right. 
Now for the police update. On Sunday night, an 18-year-old Lynn man was shot in the leg during an attempted robbery on Estes Street. According to Lieutenant Michael Kimmick, the victim, who has yet to be identified, was taken to Salem Hospital with non-life-threatening injuries. Early Sunday morning, another shooting occurred that led to a woman being shot in the hand during a drive-by shooting on Warren Street. No arrests have been made in either incident, and each remain under investigation. Steve Almanor and Widmark Duval are facing kidnapping and robbery charges after taking a man into a home and robbing him of his belongings at Knife Point. The victim, a 24-year-old male, flagged down police after the incident and informed officers that he was approached by four people while waiting for the bus. Almanor and Duval robbed the man of his cell phone, cash, and a watch. Christopher Mulcahy is facing fentanyl tra trafficking charges after police found drugs in his home on Silsby Street. Mulcahy was arrested and charged with trafficking over 10 grams of cocaine with the intent to distribute cocaine, morphine, subzon, and Class C pills including Clonopen and Xanax. Lynn Police Drug Task Force executed a search warrant at Mulcahy's Silsby Street home where they seized 20 grams of fentanyl, 17 grams of cocaine, subzazone, strips, and other pills. The Grand Army of the Republic welcomes students to the hall for the Grand Army of the Republic Tales from the Hall, a history of the Civil War. Here's a snippet from the Tales from the Hall. He would be in awe of what he sees. How many of you say, huh? Why would we be in awe of me? I'm just sitting here. The one thing that I've learned about Abraham Lincoln was his greatness was based upon all he possessed was the education of a first grade student. If slavery had been eliminated, let's say in um, 1783, when the war ends, if slavery had been eliminated in 1783, would a civil war have been fought in 1861. Well, the Lanza was instrumental in creating a home for soldiers. To this day, it's called the Chelsea Soldiers Home. It's right in Chelsea where I reside at. And in two... Arbor, to watch the full Tales from the Hall, visit lintv.org. Arbor Day celebration took place at Ford School, where students planted trees around the school with Mayor McGee and Ford Principal Joanne La Laravie. We're ready to plant a tree this morning? Yeah. Yeah, it's exciting, right? Yeah. So this is a ginkgo. It's going to be a tall shade tree and it's going to shade the pavement in the school for years to come. We've planted about 1,250 in Lynn so far, so we're a little more than halfway to our goal of 2,400 trees in Lynn. You know what kind of trees these are? These are called deciduous. Have you guys learned about deciduous trees or evergreen trees? No, though so this tree right here, the ginkgo, this is going to lose its leaves every year. What is, what's going to happen is this tree, the leaves are going to pop out of this tree right here, this ginkgo. And what, it, what it's going to do is it's going to absorb the light from the sun and it's going to create its own food through a process of photosynthesis. And it's just going to create uh, glucose that it turns into sugars and it sends down to its roots and the roots are going to pull, pull water from the ground and send it back up. This morning at City Hall, the Polish flag raising ceremony took place and LCTV sent a crew for down for the ceremony. Chechi Mai, the 3rd of May. It's the codification of the Constitution of the United States. Tadeusz Kościuszko the great patriot who was commissioned by General Washington to um, establish and build West Point 
and he was also instrumental with Thomas Jefferson in formulating the Constitution of the United States. He went back to Poland, and he actually was <laughs> instrumental in Poland being the first European country to incorporate the United States Constitution. So that's why we're here today. Residents gathered outside of City Hall on Wednesday to rally for workers and immigrants' rights at the annual May Day March, the march which began at City Hall and ended at the Lynn Museum. LCTV was on hand. It's time for us to come together to struggle for immigrant rights and workers' rights as well as all the other struggles that we have to undergo. When we show up to events like this, we remind ourselves that it doesn't matter how greedy our corporations get. It doesn't matter how much our government might ignore and disregard us. Our voices persist and persevere and only grow stronger. When we come together for the common causes that bind us as human beings on this planet, we grow stronger. We are not stupid. Are we stupid? No. We are not stupid. We know what these companies are doing and we know what capitalism is doing to harm us as humans. Sexual abuse survivors gathered at City Hall to march to bring awareness to sexual abuse. Take Back, Take Back the Night is an international movement against sexual violence and sexual abuse against women. LCTV followed residents as they marched from City Hall to the Lynn Museum. Welcome, uh, Kip. Is that who we have? We have Kip. Um, so this is our second annual uh, um, Take Back the Night march, uh, and we're so thankful for you all to be here. We must work actively so that folks from all walks of life, regardless of gender, race, ethnicity, socio socioeconomic status, ability, sexual orientation, immigration status, live lives free from sexual violence, and whereas we will work together as a community to engage new voices, faith leaders, school leaders, and community leaders to expand prevention efforts to foster attitudes and promote healthy relationships, equality, and respect. So it's April 30th, 2019, and sexual assault victimization has not declined. In fact, it has increased. Maybe the fact that statistics show sexual assault crimes are on the rise is a good thing. Maybe people are sick and tired of saying nothing and are reporting these crimes. No justice! No peace! No justice! No peace! No peace! No peace! No peace. In an effort to keep Lynn, Lynn clean, neighbors and community leaders gathered at Lynn Woods to help clean up the area. LCTV's Kanook has more on the cleanup. Elise Treyor and we're at the Lynn Woods and we're doing a cleanup that we do every once like every year and right now I'm just raking a bunch of leaves. Uh, my name is uh, Jim Shirley. I help take care of the Rose Garden with Dwayne here. Uh, we're having a cleanup today with the help of 
North Shore Community College, right? The second annual Ironbound Food Truck Festival took place on Mount Vernon Street this past weekend, and LCTV was there for the, for the festivities. Hey, what's going on, everybody? Uh, this is Justice with Ironbound Marketplace. We're out here on Mount Vernon Street, Saturday, April 27th, for the second annual Food Truck Art and Music Festival. If you take a look behind me, we've got vendors from the North Shore area, a lot of Lynn vendors out here, uh, setting up shop, testing out the market with their products. We've got food trucks, some of the best food trucks in the area. We've got Brody's Diner, Bone Town Burgers, Kowloon, Compliments, and across the border. Can't forget, right behind you, we've got Craft Beer, brewed right here in Salem, Massachusetts. Our neighbors, Notch Beer, if you turn the camera around right here. We've got the 21 Plus Beer Garden back this way, where you can also hear the music. We've got the main stage down this end of the street in front of this beautiful backdrop of a mural by the Beyond Walls team, so make sure you check them out too. Every year we do this. It's the second annual Food Truck Art and Music Festival, so stay tuned. Follow us on Facebook and social media at Ironbound Lynn, and thank you all for your support. North Shore Community College held its annual forum on tolerance in the gymnasium last week, and LCTV was in attendance. I can't All right, talk. I just want to ask the question that might push the envelope a little bit. It gets okay. to just maybe some of the fundamental social functions oh, of animals. Uh, so I'm looking at just issues such as SeaWorld or uh, situations where you know, just the function that animals play in our society, uh, do you feel like we're having any cultural or social mm. shifts in terms of how we look at the relationship between animals and human beings? Because it looks like that, uh, just to speak sociologically, that that fundamental structure of human domination mm -hmm. and animal subjugation still exists. So I just want to see how does that sort of fit into the the conversation and if people actually, you know, are addressing that. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's such an important question that you've raised and it's such a valuable thing for everybody to be thinking about. And, and, um, there are so many ways in which, um, it's easy to forget, um, that, we are taking advantage of animals um, in so many ways and that our use of animals is consumptive. And to be really cognizant of that is so important. And um, HSUS, we, we work on um, transforming the landscape for animals and, and we do that recognizing that incremental change is often the way that that has to be done, right? So this 2016 Farm Animal Protection Initiative in Massachusetts, it was, the strongest law for animals in the world when it passed. But it, was, it's, it establishes basically cage-free conditions, right? That's, that's a baby step, right, in the grand scheme of things. Um, cage-free conditions means that animals have enough space to stand up, lie down, turn around, and extend their limbs. It doesn't mean they necessarily see sunlight, they touch grass. On this week's Community Connector, we highlight Art Week kickoff and transportation on the commuter rail platform. Here is this week's Community Connector. I think everybody's met uh, Secretary Keneally. I, I really wanted to bring him by here to emphasize and to thank all the folks who've been involved in the arts and culture sector in Lynn and to remind people that it's not, economic development isn't just about big businesses and real estate development, although those are important. 
It's great because I've been living in Lynn for a couple of years now. So to finally get immersed into the uh, community is one of the goals since I've moved here. So it's a, I looked at it as, as a great opportunity to uh, get to know the people in our community here. You know, it's a it's a rare opportunity to uh, to uh, like be up here um, on the uh, MBTA platform uh, performing in the uh, in the open air. Then I was left shipwrecked. The art and culture really brings the heart and soul to a community and creates the environment in which people want to live, want to stay, and improves the places around them and really adds to that quality of life and, and particularly the hard work and, and many times uh, at a lot of self-sacrifice self and very little thanks. I mean, I think the great thing about Art Week is that there are all these other communities participating in it, so we get a lot of uh, cross-pollination, you know. There are, uh, there are events happening um, on the MBTA here in Lynn and in Swampscott and in Salem. I'm, I'm really especially happy to have the Secretary and the Mayor here to inaugurate Art Week and remind people on how important arts and culture is to local economic development and business strategies. It brings a different mode of expression for the people that live in the community. Um, and it's, it also gives the community the opportunity to commiserate with their, their neighbors that they wouldn't otherwise have known before. If, any, if anything, is a great way to unify with something that's uh, very creative, bringing people together that you know normally wouldn't be in the same room together, but they are because of this one particular way of expressing yourself. Man, just thank you all for coming. We wouldn't have arts and culture without this community, so we breathe life into each other, and um, I'm happy to kick this off. <laughs> now for the sports update. <clears throat> Lynn Tech Baseball improved to 2-0 in league play after their 6-2 victory over Mystic Valley. Ohan Ortega went seven innings, only giving up three hits, while the Tigers are now 3-4 in the season and will host Greater Lawrence Tuesday at Fraser Field. The St. Mary's boys and girls lacrosse team each got victories over Spellman on Wednesday. The Lady Spartans were led by Cody Butt, who scored six goals to go along with two assists. Meg Partham, Kelsey Sullivan, and Madai Hentosh each scored multiple goals in the Lady Spartans' 18-6 route of Spellman. Lady Spartans goalie Lauren Vaccaro had seven saves for the game. Brendan, La Brendan Laundrie led the way for the Spartans in their 14-1 route of Spellman. Laundrie scored three goals while Jide Morillo, Davis Kinn, and Zach Barden each had two goals for the Spartans. Lynn Classical softball team improved to 5-1 after their 9-0 shutout of Somerville Wednesday. Brooke, War Brooke Warren struck out 12 and was two outs away from pitching the perfect game. Brendan, Brendan Crichton, state senator of the 3rd Essex District, sat down with LCTV to give an update on what's happening at the State House. Here is Brendan Crichton with his update. Good morning. My name is Brendan Crichton and I'm the state senator for the 3rd Essex District, representing Lynn, Linfield, Marblehead, Nahant, Saugus, and Swampscott. Last time I had a chance to speak to everyone, we talked a lot about the foundation budget review and our efforts to reform education in Massachusetts. Not much of an update at this point, um, other than you know the bill had uh, a public hearing with thousands of residents that came out to testify, uh, including myself, along with some New England Patriots, in support of updating the formula to really increase our funding from one to two billion dollars annually for education. Today I want to talk a little bit more about education but what happens after the school bell rings. Our students spend roughly 80 percent of their time outside of school. So what are they doing during those off hours? I uh, recently was named the chairman of the after school and out of school time coordinating council. Just to give a brief history, in 2007, while I was working for State Senator Tom McGee, the legislature wanted to take a bigger focus on after-school programs and how to improve access. Senator McGee was named chairman of the Legislative Commission, the After-School and Out-of-School Time Commission. And they did 10 hearings across the, street, across the state, heard from over 500 residents, a wide range of backgrounds from 
students, teachers, local community members, police, fire, you know, doctors, lawyers, everyone across the spectrum came out to talk about how important after school programs were to their kids as well as their families. Fast forward about a year, the uh, commission had come up with a number of recommendations based off that testimony and one of the main uh, recommendations was to make a permanent council so that this wouldn't just be a one-year effort that identifies these issues and puts out a report. Senator McGee wanted to make sure that there was long-term action. In 2008, a bill was passed into law that would establish this after-school council. And just to give you a sense of how, how difficult it is to get a bill passed, there are over 6,000 bills filed every year in the legislature, and really only a few hundred out of those uh, non-controversial measures are uh, passed into law. And in this case, this bill establishes council, which went on to conduct more and more research through the Massachusetts After School Partnership among a wide range of stakeholders in Massachusetts. And then fast forward to today, we this past fall had uh, submitted our report, which had 22 recommendations. As the chairman of the council, I was recently invited to Chicago for the Mott Foundation's annual after school conference. There were over 50 states, not over 50 states, there were 50 states represented uh, there at the conference, a wide range of stakeholders, and I was fortunate to be on a panel to talk about our efforts here in Massachusetts and what policies we're looking to enact. It was great to hear that Massachusetts is on the forefront. We were definitely a leader out of that uh, group in, in terms of the policies that we're looking to enact, in terms of the state funding that we put towards after school programs. But when you look at our achievement gap, uh, we can, our growing achievement gap, we need to do much more. And I think one of the, the big stats that sticks out to me is the wait lifts that we, we currently have for people that have applied at over uh, at 8,000 roughly students that are eligible, low income students that are eligible to be in an after school program, but are still on a wait list. And over 320,000 students across the state that are not currently receiving after school program that, that would be eligible, that would want to. Um, for me, it's, it's an issue both morally and, and also when you look at uh, our education system and how it connects with our um, economic development and creating jobs and really closing the skills that gap that currently exists there. After uh, a, you know, a number of years with Senator McGee and the council researching um, and putting these recommendations to a report, we have 22 recommendations, two of which I would like to, to share with you here today just in the interest of time. Uh, the report is available online, and if you have further questions, please contact my office. We would love to, to discuss this more. Uh, but one of the major ones was tied to funding. And uh, really, when you look at the 8,000 number of people on the wait list currently, um, it's going to take funds uh, to get those folks into programs. And last year, when we passed the cannabis uh, law, after the, the state had voted in favor of legalizing recreational cannabis, a portion of those funds were dedicated towards prevention measure, measures and programs. We believe that there are no better prevention tools than after school programs, and we have the outcomes to really prove the impact that these programs can have to reduce addiction, to reduce you know, risky behaviors by our youth. So this year I filed a bill that would link in 3% of those prevention funds towards after-school programs. It's, it's certainly not going to be a silver bullet. This isn't going to solve all our problems. But for every student we can get off that wait list, we have another student on the right path towards success. Additionally, the program, uh, excuse me, the um, report had recommended creating a, a legislative caucus to address the issue of after-school, after-school and out-of-school time access. And I'm proud to say we recently found a, a House chairman uh, Adrian Madaro, uh, who's worked on these issues for many years, and myself are going to lead this caucus and we're going to begin to reach out to members. The idea around the Legislative Caucus is that I really think while we represent a wide range of districts across the state, we feel that every single legislature, legislator recognizes the need for these after-school programs, in particular in western and more rural parts of the state 
The access is limited because of transportation issues as well. So I, I feel like whether you're from a small town or from a big city, you're going to care about these after school programs. And there's definitely strength in numbers when it comes to getting things passed in the legislature. So we're looking to bring together this caucus, both to look for additional funding, but also to implement some of the report measures that don't necessarily have a dollar sign tied, tied to them. And you know, we're very excited about you know, pursuing these efforts, but we certainly do want to hear feedback from folks that are currently, whether you have a student that's in an after school program or you're on a wait list or are you interested, we'd love to hear your thoughts as well. So please you know, stay in touch with our office and we look forward to continuing uh, to pursue additional funds and resources. So while I think the, the achievement end um, for our students is, is a major piece, this is also uh, you know, an issue that affects families greatly. I have a three-year-old son at home. We are very spoiled in that we have two sets of grandparents nearby, brothers and sisters, a network of friends that can help support us. But really finding child care is such a difficult thing. It's such an expensive thing. And I can't imagine whether you're someone that doesn't have you know, family nearby or if you're a single parent, um, trying to make ends meet while providing that care out of school is nearly impossible and you're gonna end up sacrificing other parts of your life, including your job. Um, so while this is a, you know, an issue that's directly affecting the achievement of our children, it's also affecting families in that parents will have to give up work opportunities to stay home to take care of their kids after school. The results are all there, the outcomes are proven. Uh, this is an investment that we feel will pay great dividends um, across the state. And again, while we are number one in the country in terms of achievement of our students, if this achievement gap continues to grow, we're going to see those results eroded over time. We really have uh, some great inequalities in our state. Um, I, I do want to say thank you again to Link Community Television for providing this resource to allow me to, to speak about different issues. Um, you know, on a regular basis. And again, we encourage everyone to contact our office on this issue or other issues moving forward. Thank you very much. On this week's Lynn Lowdown, I sat down with the President and CEO of the YMCA Metro North, Kathleen Walsh. Here is this week's Lowdown. Welcome to the Lynn Lowdown. I'm your host, Mikhail Kabongo. Today we have a special guest. This is in front of her name. Before we say her name, we got to say President and CEO. You know how big that is? President and CEO of this Kathleen Walsh, President and CEO of the YMCA Metro North. How are you doing? I'm great. It, it's still surreal when I hear that title. I'm not going to lie. Yeah, they, they got to have like some theme music with I know. When I you thought walk my in. kids would treat me differently, but nothing has changed <laughs> at home. So, how are you? How's everything going on with you? It's good. I'm about two months on the job now, yeah. and things are progressing along nicely. Yeah. Always have a few obstacles, but it's been and so far, so good. Yeah, how was your transition to, to this new position? Well, I, I had been the chief operating officer for the for the Y for the prior three and a half years. Mm -hmm. So I had come from a very operational background and now in a present CEO role, my role has shifted more volunteer management, fundraising, yeah. some of the bigger projects. Okay, okay. And we have not filled my other position, so I'm juggling a little bit of both. All right, so you still Yeah, do you need a job? job? I do. <laughs> well, I'm sure one of them they're gonna need a job soon, you know, they graduate high school soon and stuff so but I see the YMCA is so big in the community you guys do so much work and just talk about just some of the the initiatives that you guys got going on right now thanks for acknowledging that uh, the Lynn Y is a massive component of the city of Lynn mm -hmm. um, you know in the in the existing building right now every single afternoon we have 500 kids or so um, 300 of them almost 300 of them are in Y Academy which is our licensed educational child care program okay. and then we have another 150 that are part of our youth center our drop-in program mm -hmm. and they come and go as they please yeah. and then we probably have another hundred and to hundred and a half of kids that just want to play ball work out you know hang with friends um, it's it's um, incredibly busy and that's our real focus right now is youth yeah um, but we also do wellness and swim lessons mm -hmm. and you know that's really important in the city yeah. as well as job preparedness some mm -hmm. college stuff, leadership. Um, we have a garden. Yeah. You know. Okay. I saw 
think it was last year you guys had the farmer's market over there yep. during the winter. They came in there and utilized this space for, for the farmer's market. And we would have loved to have done that this year as well, but our parking lot is now, if you haven't oh, noticed, <laughs> uh, about 70,000 square feet of dirt. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So speaking of parking lot and 75 square feet of dirt, you guys, construction's underway for the new facility that you guys are hoping opens at some point next year. So just talk about how's that going so far. All right, well, it's definitely going to open next year. Okay. What month? <laughs> Still up in the air. Right now we're doing the site work, yep. and the site work has become a little more challenging um, as as typical urban projects are where we find some soil that we have to remove, and mm -hmm. it's taken a little bit longer. Um, but once that gets taken care of and, and the, the parking lot settles, then the steel comes on and then we can go from there. So you should see some steel in the summertime. Mm -hmm. Now with this new facility, talk about how how it's going to differentiate from the, the current facility. I know the current facility is still going to be there once the new one opens, but Correct. let's talk about some of the, the different things that's going to be happening at the new facility. Sure. It's going to be the Lin Y campus. So most of the existing building will exist and then the entire front of the building what you see now is dirt will be a 70,000 square foot YMCA. Mm -hmm. And it's really going to be a model for the country. You know, we, we're moving our Y Academy early learning program there. And that's really, that's our, our 2.9 to 5 year old mm -hmm. education program. And that's really to accommodate the kids' learning needs better. Yep. The space that they're in right now um, isn't always conducive to learning. So they're going to have their private classrooms with high technology, their own bathrooms, things that are really important to early learners. Okay. We're also going to have um, state-of-the-art wellness and fitness for all ages. We all are working hard to fight obesity and inactivity. The Y is going to have 14,000 square feet of wellness space. That's that's massive. Mm -hmm. Just to give you an idea, that's almost double the size of what's at our PBDY, which is a hub in yeah, Peabody. Yeah. Um, we're going to have a cafe and a teaching kitchen. Cool. So the goal would be to grow vegetables in our mm -hmm. garden, be it on the roof or on the ground, the and use them to teach people how to use how to make healthy meals. Okay. Specifically starting at as kids. Yeah. They need to hear it. We're gonna have three community spaces that can be used for screenings, you know, job um, interviews, um, college support, yep. um, and we're going to have three different bodies of water. So we're going to have a lap pool, which is really important. Mm -hmm. We're going to have a teaching pool, which is a lot, it's, it's about eight degrees warmer than the lap pool. And then we're going to have a splash pad all in the pool area. Yep. So kids get used to the water on the splash pad, move to the teaching pool, mm -hmm. and then they're in the big, the bigger pool. Yeah, because you guys current, yeah, you guys have a lot of kids, especially I know Saturdays there's the swimming lessons for the little kids. And the, during the summertime, what are some of the programs that you guys have in the summer for, for uh, the kids in the, in the city? I know there's the summer program that you guys have been doing for so, for so long. So we operate from 5 in the morning until 9 p.m. in the summer time and this summer we're actually trying to secure some grant funding so that we can be open on weekends to 11 for kids kids and and you know young adults teenagers mm -hmm. that's a critical um, need that we have right now but summer we go non-stop between lessons and then our our child care camp programs it's not actually camp it's our licensed child care program mm -hmm. and then our drop-in program run all day long five days a week mm -hmm. as well as um, we, we're open to the public yeah. as well so people can come in swim for an hour go into the gym shoot mm -hmm. some basketballs uh, you know walk on the track do whatever they want to do yeah yeah it's, it's busy busy it's now, it's really busy now with, with, with all that going on what is your day-to-day -day operations like what does your day usually look like I'm not understand. telling you on TV, I'll <laughs> tell you. So I actually am the presidency of the Y of Metro North. So we yeah, have so seven different locations. Yeah. Peabody, Saugus, Marblehead. No, Peabody, oh, not part Peabody of Saugus, Melrose, Melrose. Uh, Stoneham. We have two in Melrose and two in Saugus, and then Lynn. Okay. So Marblehead is part of the Y of the North Shore, one of our um, oh, gotcha, gotcha. favorite other organizations. Okay, okay, okay. So, um, I really manage my time based on the needs of those locations, mm -hmm. particularly the fact that we didn't backfill my position, so I'm supporting some of the staff. I have a great team. Mm -hmm. I have a really great team, so I can feel really good about what's going on if, if I'm not in there, if I don't connect with them over the course of a few days. Yeah. Um, a lot of my time is spent in Lynn because there's still a lot of work to be done to take this project to the finish line, yeah. whether it's fundraising, community awareness, um, 
you know, we're getting close to the point where we're going to have the fun part of picking things out, yeah. equipment and fixtures and mm -hmm. furniture and all that stuff. But right now, you know, I'm working with our board. Um, you know, we're starting to do a strategic plan. There's a, there's a, every day it's something different, okay. it, which yeah. makes it really yeah. fun. Doesn't make your job boring. To say no, to, to and say I can that. tell you in my 28 years with the Y, and not this Y, but the Y in general, um, I can't say I've ever had a boring day. Yeah. Uh, one thing I wanted to ask, I know when I was when I was in high school, you guys used to have the homework league. Uh, is is that something that you guys would consider bringing back? Because that was that was a big hit when when I was in high middle school, high school. So tell me what school. that was. Uh, basically, it was come in, do the homework, they help you with homework and stuff, and then afterwards. Go upstairs. Uh, we have a program a called GPA. Okay. And that's a very similar program where okay, the kids okay. get support with their homework um, up until 8 o'clock at night and then they can okay. do whatever. Oh, yeah, it's, okay. it's under a different name. Oh, all right, all right, yeah. all right. So, similar thing. All right, yeah. that, that was a big hit back then. It, you know, we, we pride ourselves on helping the kids academically yep. because we understand people are working, parents are working, yep. English may not be their first language, and we want to make sure that it gets done. Mm -hmm. You know, they do their summer reading at the Y. Yep. You know, we track it, we monitor it, we make sure they're actually reading mm -hmm. the book as opposed to skimming it or, you know, some of the things that we used to do, right? Uh, um, but, you know, so they do it as a group. We okay. get the books, we give them the books, and then they have time to read, which is important. Yeah, really very, important. Reading is fundamental. And lastly, we only got a couple minutes left before we got out of here. Any, anything that you want, any dates or any events that you want to plug to the people that they should know about coming up at the Y? Yes, great. Thanks for asking. We have our um, 5K along the tide, <laughs> which is coming up on Saturday, May 18th, mm -hmm. and that's at the Nahant Lighthouse Station. Okay. All the money that we raise benefits the Lynn YMCA Scholarship Program. Okay. Um, you know, in Lynn, we give away probably three quarters of a million dollars a year in scholarships. Mm -hmm. We also have our Y annual meeting on May 23rd to Thursday, so if I got that date wrong, I apologize. It's at Lynn Vogue Tech, mm -hmm. and the kids at, at Tech are gonna make breakfast, and we're honoring uh, Warren War and Lion Auto Group as our community partner of the year, and Kevin Colcord as our volunteer of the year, and people are welcome to attend. It's going to be a great time. At that annual meeting, we also award our Youth Champion Scholarships, okay. and I think last year we had four or five kids from Lynn that, that were awarded them. All right, there you go. A lot happening at the Lynn YMCA. Thank you, Kathleen. Thank you very Ross, much, I appreciate it. I, I got a membership at the Y too, so I'm, yeah. I'm there all the time. But you guys been watching the Lynn Lowdown. Have a great day. Thank you. And now for some upcoming local events. On Saturday, May 4th from 7 a.m. until 2 p.m., Dumpster Day will be taking place. Drop-off for Dumpster Day will be at the Department of Public Works on Commercial Street. Drop-offs are only for Lynn residents. The Greenhouse Tour at North Shore Community College will be taking place from 2 p.m. until 3.30 p.m. this Saturday at the school's Lynn campus. The event will be hosted by the Lynn Kitchen Gardeners. Also on Saturday, May 4th, the Genetically Resilient Experience Gala will be taking place at the Vision Space Gallery on City Hall Square from 6 p.m. until 10 p.m. The gala is a black tie event. On Tuesday, May 7th, a public meeting will be taking place at the Lynn Housing Authority for, for the Lynn Municipal Harbor Plan and Waterfront Master Plan from 6 p.m. to 7.30 p.m. The Veterans and Community Job and Resource Fair will be happening at North Shore Community College on Thursday from 1 p.m. until 4 p.m. Lastly, Lynn Tech will be hosting its International Night on Thursday, May 9th from 6 p.m. until 9 p.m. in the main cafe. Food, music, and prizes will be provided to the participants of the talent show. LCTV's next Paramount film series will take place on Monday, May 13th. The movie choice for this month is Godzilla vs. Mothra. Doors open at 6.30 p.m. Movie begins at 7 p.m. Free popcorn and beverages will be available to those in attendance. Thank you for watching the LCTV News. Like us on Facebook and subscribe to our YouTube channel and visit us at lintv.org to watch any show anytime on your computer, tablet, or phone. I'm Mukala Kabongo and have a great day.